Good afternoon to everybody, but also good morning and good evening to many of us. It's our pleasure to welcome you to our second um, webinar in the series of ITM alumni webinars featuring the ITM winners of the prize for Global Research 2023. The Prize for Global Research is awarded yearly by the province of Antwerp to research projects of master after master students of ITM and other higher education institutes. Development relevance, quality and originality of the master thesis are key in the selection. Through this award, the province of Antwerp wants to stimulate global research. In the second webinar, MTM alumnus and laureate Kehinde Sherafadin Okunade will share insights from his master thesis entitled Development of Antepartum Risk Prediction Model for Postpartum Hemorrhage in Lagos, Nigeria. The main aim of this series of webinars is to share research findings, expertise and experiences on a specific topic within the ITM community of alumni, students, staff, partner institutions and the wider global health community. I will now briefly explain some of the webinar practicalities. If you want to ask a question, you can use the Q&A box uh, you have uh, below your screen. If you want to ask your question in live, you can also raise your hands and we will unmute you during the Q&A uh, session. The chat is being disabled for questions. Questions will be moderated and only a select number of questions can be answered in live given the limited time. Unanswered questions cannot be answered individually afterwards, for which we apologize. You can, however, use the forum function uh, in the online alumni platform to start a discussion on your questions left after this webinar. At the end of the webinar, a short survey will be displayed and a browser window will open to give your feedback. The webinar is being recorded and will be made available afterwards on the ITM alumni platform. Our today's moderator is uh, Tom de Croo, co-director co co of the Master in Tropical Medicine and head of TB HIV unit at the Clinical Science Department of ITM. Tom de Croo is a medical doctor. Um, he's involved in multiple research projects on the diagnosis and treatment of resistant TB. Um, like I said, he is the co-director of the Master of Science in Tropical Medicine, Clinical Science Orientation, uh, and he prioritizes working with both master and PhD students. So please, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charlotte, for this uh, introduction. So it was a pleasure last year to work with Dr. K. Hinde. Uh, he is an associate professor at the College of Medicine at the University of Lagos and also consultant obstetrician and gynecologist at uh, Lagos University. Uh, he's a fellow of faculty in, uh, was a faculty, uh, faculty fellow in 2018 till 2019 and a Johnson & Johnson fellow between 2021 and 2023. He completed his Master of Science uh, in Tropical Medicine uh, with the Clinical Science Orientation in August 2023. So now we look forward to listening to Dr. Kehinde as, Kehinde as he presents his, uh, his work, which he won the prize last year, last academic year. Thank you. And looking forward to your Q&As. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for the nice introduction. So I will go ahead and share my, my screen now. Can you confirm it with, uh, you can see the screen? Yes, we can. Maybe just if you can put it. Yes, perfect. Presentation okay. mode. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening, wherever you are. Um, just like uh, Tom has said, I'm Ken De uh, I work at the Lagos Foundation Hospital and uh, also as a professor at the College of Medicine, University of Lagos. Um, basically, this is, I'm just uh, going to be presenting my, uh, 
uh, this is a topic today, which is uh, uh, tied to the development of antipartum risk prediction model for postpartum uh, hemorrhage in Lagos, Nigeria, which I tagged at the PREDICT PPH study. Uh, I obtained funding from, for this work uh, from the Johnson & Johnson Foundation uh, Fellows uh, Educational Grant of, of 2022 to 2023. As, a, uh, as, at, as at then, I was a Johnson & Johnson uh, Global Public Health Research and Development Fellow. And this was one, one of the grants I was able to obtain to complete the Master of Science in Tropical Medicine program. Also, I report no conflict of interest in the conduct and reporting of the findings of, uh, of the study I'm about to present here today. So by uh, way of introduction, approximately 295,000 women uh, die annually due to pregnancy and childbirth related complications uh, worldwide. And uh, about 94% of these deaths occur in resource limited settings, which included um, Sub-Saharan Africa and of course Nigeria, is one of those uh, countries in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Obstetric hemorrhage or bleeding, uh, especially the one that occurred during childbirth, account for about 25 to 27% of global maternal mortality. And uh, in, in most developing countries, including Nigeria, bleeding during childbirth or what we call postpartum hemorrhage or simply PPH is the leading cause of maternal death. So why did we decide to do this study? We know that currently one of the most effective strategies to reduce maternal mortality due to postpartum hemorrhage is to identify women that are at risk of developing this complication at childbirth earlier on in pregnancy. However, there is currently a limited ability to accurately identify women that are at risk before they develop this complication. There have been some few attempts to, de to develop some risk prediction models that combine certain, certain um, clinic, uh, clinical or social demographic factors that have been linked strongly to postpartum hemorrhage. However, these models are performed very poorly in most clinical settings, leading to their reduced clinical uh, applicability and use in decision making. So why are these models not very useful currently? It is because these models were developed based on retrospective data. And we all know that retrospective data are characterized by incomplete and missing variables. So some of these models require some very important variables which are not included in model building, making it very inaccurate for, uh, for use in the classifying women as either low risk or high risk. The model was also built based on visual inspection of postpartum blood loss. And we know when you visually estimate postpartum blood loss, it, it is usually characterized by underestimation that lead to inaccurate and late diagnosis of postpartum hemorrhage. And also, these models were not developed nor validated in resource limited settings, where you and I know that most maternal mortality due to postpartum hemorrhage usually occur. So what is the research question I try to ask? So we had the question that what is the antipartum risk prediction model and its derived risk scoring system for postpartum hemorrhage? and its performance in a cohort of LD pregnant women in Lagos, Nigeria. So this takes us to um, developing our objective. And the primary objective was to develop and evaluate the performance of an antipartum risk prediction model and a derived risk scoring system for postpartum hemorrhage in a cohort of LD pregnant women in Lagos, Nigeria. The secondary objective includes one, to determine the prevalence of postpartum hemorrhage because there is limited data on the true prevalence of postpartum hemorrhage in Sub-Saharan Africa. And second, to assess the antipartum predictors of postpartum hemorrhage in this cohort of pregnant women. So we conducted these studies uh, in five F facilities in Lagos. And this included three tertiary facilities, among which include, uh, included the Lagos University Station Hospital, which is the second largest station hospital in Nigeria where I currently work. And also, we, we also enrolled participants from two secondary facilities that included Lagos Island Maternity Hospital, which is the largest maternity, maternity hospital in Africa. So together, these five facilities account for an annual delivery rate of about 12,000 delivery, making it very, very uh, easy for us to be able to enroll our participants over the duration of the study period. So we used a prospective course study design 
to enroll our participants over a duration of six months. The enrollment of the participants took place between January to March 2023, while we follow up these women between February to June 2023 to collect their outcome delivery data. The participants for the study were consecutively consenting LD pregnant women uh, within the reproductive age, which is 15 to 49 years of age, at 28 to 36 weeks of pregnancy, which is about the time that we do bad preparedness and complication readiness counseling in pregnancy. So following enrollment, we follow up these women up to the time of their delivery to collect their delivery data, which included postpartum blood loss uh, during childbirth. We excluded women that have coagulation disorders, those that have sickle cell anemia, those with intrauterine fetal death, and those that were lost to follow up in, the, uh, in our data analysis. So we calculated our sample size based on the maximum modeling principle as proposed by Perducci et al. And this was based on the assumption that uh, we, have, we are going to input 10 predictor variables in our model, with each of the predictor variable had 10 minimum events occurring at an estimated prevalence of 10.8%, and then we got a minimum sample size of 926. We also made provision uh, to uh, made assumption for evaluation of our model performance using area under the curve uh, value of 0 0.7 to obtain a sample size of 250. We made provision for 20% attrition rate based on the largest sample size that we calculated, which is 926, to obtain an overall sample size of 1,158, which is what we intended to enroll, the number of women we intended to enroll into the study. Prior to conducting this, um, uh, this study, we have obtained ethical approval from the study site from the Institutional Review Committee of uh, Lagos Fire Station Hospital and other uh, facilities that we use in Lagos, and also from the Institute of Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. Uh, we develop a case report uh, form uh, on the RECAP database, which we use to collect our enrollment and delivery data. So the delivery data was actually quantified postpartum blood loss uh, within 24 hours of delivery that we collected with the use of a calibrated blood collection V-drip. The calibration, calibrated blood collection V-drip, which is what is shown in this diagram, allow for a more accurate test more accurate measurement of postpartum blood loss because this is graded, calibrated, and you can actually use it to do a correct, a more a precise, accurate measurement of the amount of blood loss uh, during childbirth. This is um, this is also considered to be more, I mean, about four times more accurate than visual estimation of blood loss, which is what was used in previous study. So the operational definition of PPH in our study was postpartum blood loss that is greater than or equal to 500 mils. We perform our statistical analysis using SPSS version 28. Missing data uh, was handled using multiple imputation method. We also uh, computed the um, descriptive statistics uh, of relevant data and uh, perform a binary logistic regression to identify the potential predictors of PPH that we inputted in our model. So this was done by doing a bivariable analysis followed by a multivariable analysis. Then we also selected some variables that were strongly linked to postpartum hemorrhage uh, ab initial, and this included the age of participant, anemia, and of course prior history of postpartum hemorrhage. So variables that were selected a priori, which included age and age of the participant, anemia, and prior PPH, and those variables that had p-value of less than 0 0.1 in our bivariate analysis were included in the final multivariable analysis. So statistical significance was reported at p-value of less than 0 0.05. After the multivariable analysis, we developed a risk scoring system by dividing each significant variable's regression coefficient by the lowest coefficient in our model to derive the score point for each of the significant variable in the model. So the score point, the sum of the score points was then used to derive the risk score for each participant within the data set of, uh, that we use in the study. We also evaluated our model performance by uh, analyzing what we call the, the area under the risk operating characteristics. 
So we use this to determine the model discriminant power. And the discriminant power, the area under the curve value, that is, 0 point, that is between 0 0.7 to 0 0.8, were categorized as satisfactory. And when it is between 0 0.8 to 0 0.9, it is categorized as good. And when it is 0 0.9 to 1.0, it is categorized as excellent. So any value that is more than 0 0.7 is susceptible for risk discrimination in our model. So based on the optimal sensitivity and specificity, we also selected our PPA risk cutoff score uh, that we use in categorizing our participants into whether they are low risk or high risk. Finally, we also explore the model accuracy uh, based on the selected PPA risk cutoff score. Uh, to obtain our sensitivity and specificity, uh, the positive and negative, uh, the first negative and first positive rate, and the predictive value, both positive and negative predictive values. So, after conducting this study, we are able to enroll 1,222 elderly pregnant women into the study. And, and then after following them up to the time of delivery, 1,188 uh, participant data were available for data analysis. And out of this number, 441 women had the postpartum hemorrhage, while 747 did not have postpartum hemorrhage. This giving us a prevalence of PPH. Uh, to be equal to 37.1%. We also completed the um, descriptive statistics for all the potential predictors of PPH, which we uh, presented in our univariate uh, table. And uh, more importantly, we look at, uh, in, this, uh, in this presentation, more importantly, I'm going to be looking at uh, some of the, uh, the variable that we selected a priority, and this included age of participant. For 23.9% of participants were 35 years and above, while 46.6 had anemia, while only 2.2 had previous history of postpartum hemorrhage. Our multivariable analysis was also able to allow us to be able to identify independent predictors of postpartum hemorrhage, which included obesity, anemia, previous cesarean delivery, and previous postpartum hemorrhage. Obesity at an adjusted odd ratio of 3.3 anemia at 1.4, previous cesarean delivery with an adjusted odd ratio of 4.2, and previous postpartum hemorrhage with an adjusted odd ratio of 2.7. Following this, we developed a PPA risk scoring system using all these four variables. So we allocated a score point for each predictor variable according to its coefficient value in our multivariate multi model. So each coefficient was then divided by the lowest coefficient in the model, which is maternal anemia, that has a coefficient of 0 0.297. So once we use this to divide all the coefficients, we got a value that we rounded up to the nearest integer. So for obesity, we got a score point of four. Anemia gave us a score point of one. Previous serum delivery gave us a score point of five. While previous postpartum hemorrhage gave us a score point of three. So in total, we have a total score point of 13, maximum that each participant can obtain. Following this, we, we obtain a risk score for each of the participants. And the risk score is obtained by summing up the score point for all the identified predictor variables in each participant. So for instance, if a participant is obese and has anemia, that participant will have a score point of five, that is four plus one. After this, we evaluated the model performance using what we call the receiver operating characteristic analysis uh, by plotting the, the graph of the risk score against the PPH category. And this gave us an area under the curve of 0 0.7, which is considered to be satisfactory and acceptable for risk discrimination. And based on the, the optimal sensitivity and specificity, we selected our cutoff score to be 4. So we also explore our model accuracy based on the selected risk cutoff score of four that we obtained from our receiver operating characteristic curve. And we obtained a sensitivity of 68.9%. The specificity of the model was 69.5%. The first negative rate was 31.1%. The first positive rate was 30.5%. Positive predictive value was 57.1%. And we obtained a negative predictive value of 79.1%. Um, 
So this study gave us a PPH prevalence of 37.1%. And the figure is higher than the overall global prevalence of PPH, which is currently pegged at 10.8%, according to the meta-analysis conducted by Cavat et al. in 2012. And also the uh, reported prevalence in other previous studies, uh, which are much more higher, I mean, much more lower than the prevalence that we obtained in our study. So we opine that because the PPH cutoff score that we use in this study, which is 500 mils of blood loss, uh, we give us the tendency to reduce on the estimation of the true prevalence of PPH as we observed in other previous studies, because we felt the PPH prevalence in other previous studies were grossly underestimated. Because the blood loss measurement in our study involved the use of a calibrated blood collection V-drip, rather than visual inspection estimation of blood loss as currently done in previous study. So our measurement gave us a more precise and objective quantification of blood loss. However, because the enrollment sites that we use in our study were mostly referral facilities because they are all secondary or tertiary healthcare centers, there's a tendency that the women that we enrolled in our study at higher risk of surgical complication, which included postpartum hemorrhage, which make it possible for the reason why we have um, a relatively high prevalence of 37.1% for PPH. Our model, however, has a comparable or higher discriminant power as that of other previous studies, which have reported an area under the curve of between 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. So our model compare um, relatively better than most of the previous, uh, or that of the previous studies. However, it is important for us to note that our first positive rate is 30.5%. Therefore, our model application could result in unnecessary maternal anxiety. Therefore, it is important for us to apply this tool by accompanying this application with adequate information and counseling to allay the fears and anxieties of mothers. Also, the first negative rate that we reported was 31.1%, and this could result in false assurance among obstetric staff who could think that with um, by applying the tool and the woman has, the woman is negative or has is categorized as low risk that there is no problem. However, this could give a false assurance. Therefore, the training of obstetric staff on the use and limitation of the risk score and the need to always remain vigilant should always be emphasized that even whether the woman is low risk, there is always a need to keep um, to be more vigilant because a low-risk woman can still develop complications, even though rarely. Our study is not, is not without a few limitations. The first limitation is that our Roman clinics were mostly in referral facilities, tertiary and secondary facilities, which uh, make it, um, you know, make it very, uh, meaning that uh, our participants were possibly uh, those that are at higher risk of having obstetric complications. Despite the acceptable discriminant power that we obtained in this study, which is the area under the curve value of 0 0.7, further validation is still required before we can apply this model for using routine clinical decision making. This few limitation will not take away from the many strengths of our study. And the first is that this is a multi center study with a very large sample size before that we conducted the resource limited settings um, of Sub Saharan Africa. Also, we use the prospective study design uh, as against the retrospective uh, study design that was used in all the previous models that have been previously developed, making it very easy for us to be able to infer some causality in the model. Also, the use of calibrated blood collection drip that we use in quantifying blood loss gave a more accurate uh, a measurement of postpartum blood loss. And finally, this is the first GIT model resource limited setting where most postpartum hemorrhage occur. So in conclusion, our study found a relatively high prevalence of postpartum hemorrhage at a value of 37.1, much more higher than the global prevalence of 10.8. We also obtained that independent predictors of PPH included maternal obesity, anemia, previous insulin delivery, and previous postpartum hemorrhage. Our model performs satisfactorily in identifying women at risk of PPH based on the model performance uh, measurement of the area under the curve value of 0 0.72. So we made this following recommendation. One, 
The derived school scoring system that we developed from this uh, study could be a potentially useful tool to screen and identify women at risk of postpartum hemorrhage during their routine bar preparedness and complication readiness care that usually apply between 28 to 36 weeks of pregnancy. This model should, however, be cautiously applied in practice, pending when further validation, both internally and externally, an evaluation of its potential usefulness as the clinical decision-making tool is performed. Meanwhile, the application of these tools should always be accompanied by strategies for primary and secondary prevention of the modifiable risk factor that we identify as predictors in this study, which included obesity. So women that are, that are obese should be advised to look some weight. Women that are anemic, should be, anemia should be corrected. While those with um, uh, women should also be made not to have unnecessary primary cesarean delivery because of the higher risk of developing postpartum hemorrhage. In, in future pregnancy and delivery. So thank you for listening, God bless. Thank you, Kehinde, for this uh, very nice presentation uh, with very clear slides. Uh, it was very interesting. So uh, we will now go to the Q&A section of uh, this circle. I see that there are multiple uh, questions in the Q&A. If you'd like to uh, ask your question live, Please raise your hand. Meanwhile, uh, I will start with the questions already shown in the Q&A. And maybe a first question is about the generalizability. How do you think that your findings uh, can be applied to a setting where uh, yeah, healthcare attendants are working uh, in a hard to reach facility? I guess with less, where it's more difficult to identify some of the risk factors that you've identified. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you for that question. Yes, it's, it's um, this, like um, um, I mentioned, this is actually still a work in progress. It's, it's an attempt to build a model, especially the first one in resource limited setting of Sub Saharan Africa. Uh, for now, this model, the applicability or generalizability of this model beyond uh, the type of facilities where this study was conducted, which include secondary and tertiary facility, is still cannot be guaranteed. So this study can only be, be um, generalized to secondary and tertiary facilities within the Lagos metropolis. Um, however, there's a future plan to conduct this study in other peripheral centers, especially in how to reach primary care facilities um, in Nigeria. So that is the next step after this particular study. Thank you. And uh, that was a question from uh, Dominic, and I have a second question from Dominic, is, uh, which is, how will your study influence or discourage home delivery as opposed to mitigating uh, uh, the PPH? Yes, the, th th that's a good, a good question, Dominic. I, I, I think uh, the mo most important thing is that uh, uh, these two, what we intend to develop at the end of the day, once we're able to validate uh, this uh, model and the and the uh, the risk scoring system, is to actually see whether these two will be able to, will be applicable, where can be used by the women themselves or by the by people that attend to them within the communities at home, so that they can actually do a risk stratification for them and be able to determine whether they are low risk or high risk. So for those that are high risk, they have to be referred to have their delivery within. Um, uh, healthcare facilities where they supervise, um, uh, where they can be supervised by uh, skilled healthcare attendants. Uh, however, though they have no risk, even though, like I mentioned, it should still be applied with caution. Though that are categorized as low risk, can have their home delivery. Currently, home delivery rate in in the resource limited setting, uh, even if you look at Nigeria as a case scenario, is still up to about um, 60, 70 percent. So it's still very high. So yes, these two, once we are able to develop it, will be useful for risk stratification within the home and can be applied by the women themselves to determine their risk uh, or risk uh, uh, classes. And they can then determine whether they have to go to the hospital or to take, I mean, to have their delivery at home. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kehinde. I have a few questions from Little Anna uh, with regards to the risk factors identified. So maybe the first one is, what do you mean by a previous unnecessary C-section? And how would you ass assess that uh, post-factor? I guess it refers to the unnecessary. 
Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, because um, I, I made that because as an obstetrician, we know that uh, most uh, primary cesarean uh, uh, section were usually not necessary because uh, probably because uh, the women were attended to by people that are not skilled and didn't have enough patients with monitoring labor. So, and, um, you know, because uh, sometimes most facilities in, in, for instance, in Nigeria, uh, cesarean section rate can be as high as um, 50, 60 percent. That is especially for primary cesarean section. That is a non, that is huge. So sometimes it is usually very important that the first delivery is attended by someone that is skilled, that be able to monitor labor um, efficiently and effectively, and be able to determine when cesarean section is necessary, so that we don't give uh, conduct cesarean section when it is not necessary. Because once a cesarean section has been conducted. Based on our findings of this study, that means the woman is at risk of developing PPH in previous, I mean, subsequent pregnancy. And uh, so there's a need to actually determine whether that first cesarean delivery is necessary or not. And uh, that's why I focus more on unnecessary cesarean delivery. Because um, even in some facilities, uh, especially private facilities, cesarean delivery can be conducted just for profit purposes and not really because there are any indication to conduct them. So that's why that recommendation was made. Thank you. Another question is about obesity, uh, which was identified as a risk factor. So how do you explain that obesity is such a strong predictor? Yes, uh, good question. Thank you. Uh, obesity as um, women have had, um, so is directly or indirectly it's, uh, linked to, to, to certain marriage because of the fact that uh, women that are obese uh, are at higher risk of uh, being given cesarean uh, section during their delivery because um, usually difficult to examine them in labor, difficult to be able to supervise, difficult to monitor the baby. So a lot of times, some obstetrician or not obstetrician in this scenario, uh, a lot of uh, 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 bath attendants would tend to want to err on the side of caution by just giving them cesarean section. So. Compared to people that are less, that are not obese, women that are obese have the tendency to be given cesarean delivery. So making, meaning that uh, if cesarean section is linked to postpartum hemorrhage, that means those that are obese who have higher tendency of having cesarean delivery also have a higher risk of having PPH. And secondly, because of some hormonal imbalances or some, some hormonal alteration that come with being obese, there's also these chances of having disruption of contra uterine contractility. And then because the uterus is not contracting adequately in the second or third, in the third stage of labor, this can result in uterine atony. And uterine atony is known to be the commonest cause of postpartum hemorrhage, especially for primary postpartum hemorrhage. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a question about the endpoint used uh, or how it was measured. So. Do you think that the cutoff of 500 cc for the V-drape, uh, uh, that it kind of uh, influenced uh, the results of your finding, especially the prevalence and maybe all the predictors identified? Yes. Um, the reason why we decided to use a, a cutoff value of 500 mils as opposed to 1,000 uh, or 1 liter that is used by some other study is because of the fact that uh, Women in our part of the world actually um, relatively, uh, compared to the high income setting, usually go into labor with a, a state of relative anemia. Uh, usually we have um, an, the average uh, uh, HB, uh, hemoglobin uh, concentration, is usually at, at about um, 9.5 gram per deciliter, meaning that most women are actually anemic by the time they go into labor. So you don't want to use a higher cutoff value, up to 1,000. By which time, if you want to wait for 1,000, that woman is already having some hemodynamic instability. So using a relatively lower cutoff value will allow you to be able to institute measure before that woman bleed excessively at a point where you are no longer able to institute any measure to be able to save her life. And that is why we feel that for low income, I mean, for low income setting or for low resource setting, where women are relatively anemic at baseline, you should use, it is better to use the relatively lower cutoff value, which is why we use 500 mils in this particular study. Thank you. And a few questions uh, by little about the tool. So how does this V-drip work? Yeah? And uh, how does it affect uh, women wearing clothes? Yeah? So 
and how much block is, is at the end ending up in the drape or compared to maybe the clothes. Can you comment a bit about the practicality of using this uh, V-drape for the measurement of uh, block loss? Yes, basically the V-drape is um, as a, um, an, an, an adhesive plaster that you attach to the footing of the bed, meaning that uh, all you need to do is to attach it to the foot of the bed and uh, it collects all the blood. So what basically what you need to do is tilt the, um, it's, it's, it's not, there's nothing that is foolproof, it's not 100% uh, accurate, but it's much more better, much more accurate and much more precise than using visual inspection, uh, which there's a tendency for us to underestimate. So basically what you do is to attach the, the dripping, I mean, to attach the dripping to the foot of the bed. And then once that woman bleeds, it is collected within uh, the uh, the collection drip. And then for those, sometimes, uh, basically what you can also use, because sometimes when the woman is in delivery, you also use some pads. So you can also weigh those pads, which part of what we use in this current study. You weigh the pad, and there are ways in which you can quantify the blood loss based on the weight of the pad. So then you can have that particular value to the value that you estimate that you collected or quantify based on the, uh, the collection drip. Then that is the total blood loss at the end of the day that you're going to record against that woman's uh, uh, name. So it is much, it, it is, it, it is not, there is not, there is nothing that is 100% accurate, but it is much more accurate. And based on data, existing data, it is up to four times more accurate than doing, uh, using visual estimation. And was it practical that women, uh... Uh, did the women themselves, did they accept the use of the V-drape? And, and what about the practitioners, the healthcare workers? Is it an, a, a tool that is acceptable to them? Yes, I, I, I think so. This is actually not the first study that look at uh, the usefulness, even though we did do an implementation study to know whether it's really acceptable. But uh, fortunately for us, um, our women that uh, participated in our study were, didn't have any problem with uh, the use of the drip. Once uh, the only thing is that uh, they have to lie down for that particular period where we are still uh, collecting uh, the the blood loss. Uh, so it's we didn't have any woman that complain about its use, even though there is a need at the end of the day, uh, maybe for future study to for, to actually look at the implementation side of the use, uh, implementation science uh, research side of the use of this uh, uh, collection drip. Then with regards to the sensitivity and specificity shown for uh, for your uh, for your uh, score, uh, do you think that the model that you propose that it could be recommended for for the things uh, you are working with the high prevalence uh, of 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 yeah, postpartum hemorrhage and also with a high uh, this was a question on blessing Mabel. Yes. Yes. Because of the high prevalence in our setting, that is actually the model is actually very useful. But it, it, it is sort of what uh, yes, but the sensitivity and specificity were not perfect. Will be uh, might be detected as uh, being at risk. While in fact they they didn't experience uh, the event. You were still. How what do you think uh, about this comment about the not excellent tool? Sorry, I think sorry, I didn't get that. Um, maybe, I can, maybe you have to repeat the question. Hi, right, Tom. You are muted. You are muted, Tom. Do you hear Tom, me now? You are muted. Okay. Yes, I can hear you now. I, I guess it's a connectivity issue. But uh, so the question was about the performance of the tool. Yeah. Do you think that this tool performs good enough for what yes. you Yes, the the model performance really for is is the model performance was based on the area under the cuff. You can actually um, look at um, assessing model performance based on the model accuracy using sensitivity specificity, and of course the um, the predictive values, and they're also using the area under the cuff. So we 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 assess the model the model performance really that uh, we base most of the decision on whether this tool is useful or not. Uh, was on the area under the curve, uh, the ROC analysis, that's the receiver operating characteristics uh, analysis. And then uh, with a value of 0 0.7, we feel that yes, it's, it, it has a, 
a good discriminant power to be able to discriminate between those that have uh, that are high risk and low risk of developing PPH. Just like I reiterated in the discussion, uh, it's, it's it's not foolproof. It's not it's not foolproof. There's no tool that is foolproof yet. So this is just a work in progress. So based on the sensitivity that we obtain, because with sensitivity of 69 percent, we still have some you know uh, some false negative uh, and false positive. Uh, um, uh, value that are in the range of 30%. So it's very important for us to apply this tool very cautiously and not to, you know, think that a uh, whole, that everything is in order and not, uh, and still not monitor every woman in labor. But that still gives us an opportunity to be able to say, uh, especially for in our setting where most women deliver at home, to be able to say, yes, you can still deliver at home. But and you, you should not deliver at all. So it is much more useful to be able to detect those that are at high risk and allow them to deliver than picking those that are lower risk of developing people. Thank you, Kehinde. So another question, uh, this time from Rodrigo, related to the performance of your tool. So given that uh, some of the cases will be missed, huh? uh, how could you then prepare the healthcare facilities and the healthcare workers to handle those cases yeah, that cannot be predicted? Yes, so part, uh, part of the recommendation I made is that, uh, yes, that uh, even though you apply the tool, the woman is categorized as low risk, that does not mean it should throw away all caution and still not uh, remain vigilant. So it's, there's a need to always remain vigilant, regardless of whatever the risk uh, classification of the woman is. Uh, but more importantly, the, there is no study that is without limitation, so there's still a need for us to be able to validate this study and I mean this particular model and see whether it's actually whether we can the performance can actually be um, higher if you evaluate the use of this model in another setting. But the application should always be accompanied with uh, with uh, caution. And also, uh, like I mentioned, uh, that should still not take away from the fact that uh, those uh, factors that we are able to identify as predictors that we should not put in measures to, to prevent or modify these factors before uh, the woman go, uh, get pregnant or goes into labor. Thank you. I uh, also had a few questions from my, from my own. So what, what make, make you choose this topic? Uh, did you, are, because uh, you have some experience, of course, in this field, but how did you choose this topic? OK, thank you. Um, Thank you, Tom. The, the first reason uh, why I choose the topic is because, of course, I'm an obstetrician. So it's easier to go to the <laughs> to area of, um, of uh, that I have very big interest in. And secondly, I, like I mentioned, I was a fellow at the uh, Johnson & Johnson Global Public Health R&D, uh, where I was attached to a unit that is developing a product for, uh, for postpartum hemorrhage. And uh, so I feel that uh, with development of this model, uh, that can help you identify women that will actually require the use of the product. I don't want to um, name the product, but of course, that product may be much useful for those that are categorized as iris, uh, based on the model that I'm going to uh, develop, which I eventually develop. So that is why I developed interest in looking at something that will also be applicable to the to the um to that particular team I was um, or to that particular uh, program I was attached to during my fellowship program in Johnson and Johnson thank you and um, my final question is okay the first comment huh? so it's very impressive that you during a master uh, course were able to conduct a prospective study um that's quite rare eh? so if studies are done uh, they're usually retrospective I guess because the uh, retrospectives are more feasible. So I'd like to ask you, uh, what were the lessons learned? What could you recommend to others who'd like to uh, conduct prospective studies uh, for the purpose of their thesis work uh, with regards to the support needed and the, and the, and the planning? Yeah, it's actually quite challenging. One of the very, very engaging tasking period <laughs> of my professional life. Because, uh, but uh, more importantly, um, 
I was able to do that. Um, if with benefit of eyesight, I'm not sure I, I, I was going to. I'm going to do something like that for a master's program. I don't think. <laughs> I will, but but when you look at it, is what is because I'm here today. Um, yeah, at least getting a prize for that particular effort. So it's worth it. But I'm not sure I'm going to repeat something like that for a master's. Are you not uh, like repeating because of what? <laughs> No, because it's, it, it was quite challenging. It was a very challenging one. Too. But more, but fortunately, initially when I proposed the study, I actually proposed three facilities. But along the line, I had to modify my proposal to include additional two facilities because it looked very impossible to be able to enroll the participant within the time I had. So I had to uh, add two more facilities to make it fine. So which was what made it very easy because uh, I had to go to the largest maternity centers, you know, because that particular facility was not included at the initial, so I had to include the Lagos and Maternity Hospital, where I was able to get most of the participants enrolled in the study. So, but it, it all has to do with, um, uh, with uh, determination, uh, with uh, resilience. So for, if you're able to get the funding, which I was fortunate to get, uh, because without funding, I don't think this kind of study is possible to do. Um, I, if official students are able to get this kind of funding, then why not? They can do it, but they should know the challenges that, uh, that it entails to be able to do that. Thank Question you. from Rodrigo is related to that. Do you think that there will be a role for a kind of research network to, uh, yeah, to support such uh, pragmatic trials in such settings as yours? With this help, imagine there will be different students and uh, working in similar fields, uh, gaining and sharing experiences. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, there is there is opportunity for that. Yes, yes, I agree with that. So, how could that how could that be beneficial? Uh, like I mentioned, more importantly, uh, well, there, there is a need for funding. You have to be able to have access to funding uh, because uh, it's very important. Uh, then uh, they also, uh, when, once you're in a program, they should also look for more opportunities to be able to uh, collaborate with, um, I'm ready to collaborate with students that want to do something similar or something related to that. Uh, and I'm also ready to make available the data set from the study for those that also want to do some secondary analysis of the data set. If they have uh, something uh, they feel is very important that uh, they've been able to identify from what we have presented here today. Uh, they are, the data is robust, up to 1,200 participant data. So, but uh, more importantly is if you have to do a prospective study uh, for over the duration of time that I spent uh, doing this is challenging, but uh, it's not impossible. Yeah. Thank you. I'd like to add that uh, also Dr. Kinder was a very independent student, so I think that also helped her. You were uh, uh, very much... Uh, self-reliant uh, and ask for support, of course, when needed. So that was uh, also remarkable uh, how well you could, you functioned as a, as a student, but also as somehow as a PI you know, of this uh, of this study. Now, my last question to you is, okay, what are your next steps in your career? And how does the master of this research support you with that? Oh, thank you, Tom. Very interesting question, yeah. Um, Still, the plan is still to, um, I, I'm actually in a professional line. I'm an associate professor, uh, soon to become a full professor uh, next year. Um, but there's still that plan because um, um, my career was uh, started off uh, based on a clinical fellowship, um, which um, is what we usually use to uh, you know, enter into academics in Nigeria. But there's also the need to also um, obtain a PhD at the end of the day. So the plan is to get a PhD um, in tropical medicine at the end of the day. And um, we, we focus more on reproductive uh, health um, uh, in terms of uh, looking at it from the global perspective uh, based on collaboration between global north and global south at the end of the day. So uh, that is the plan for the future. Um, and that is what I'm working toward uh, right from the beginning of uh, uh, 2024. Thank you, thank you. Yes, go ahead. That, that's, thank you. Okay, so thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kahina, thank you all. Uh, 
uh, for this uh, presentation, also the lively discussion. Uh, I pass the word back to, to Charlotte. Yes, also it's my turn to say a big thank you to Kehinde for sharing your research findings and important research findings, I think, as well. Uh, also, Tom, uh, thank you very much for uh, moderating uh, the webinar. Also, thank you to the participants for uh, sharing your questions and for being uh, present, of course. Um, I will now also launch the polling, so it would be great if you could complete uh, the two uh, questions, polling questions. And I would like to invite you as well. Uh, to the third upcoming webinar next week on the 12th of uh, October with uh, MSDH alumna uh, Angelique Jacobs from South Africa, who will be sharing as well her research findings. It will take place from 11 uh, a.m. till 12 um, in the morning more because, uh, yeah, due to time differences. So uh, thank you very much once more to uh, Kehinde and Tom and uh, looking forward to seeing you all back um, next week. Um, and in the meantime, uh, yeah, stay healthy, I would say, and uh, all the best. Looking forward for the next uh, webinar and thank you once more. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you, Thank Tom. you very much.